Yeah, <laughs> nice to see you. I'm so happy you're, yeah, you're finally connected. Um, the Wi-Fi might be a little bit wonky, but we'll just play what we can play with. Well, just to give a quick introduction, welcome back to Safe Spaces series. It's my little podcast about mental health and nightlife. And today my guest is Luisa with three H's, three H. Um, New, York, <laughs> yeah. yes. New York born, ah. Paris based, vocalist, producer, DJ, co-founder of the label RAAR. I think that's how you say it or do you say RAR? These are RAR. RAR. <laughs> <laughs> and also oh, a, she had her own podcast. Oh, sorry. I think we're having a little bit of a delay, but um, yeah, you also have your own podcast about mental health or more, more about sobriety, like I said, like I saw. It's more about sobriety, mental health. I mean, it all goes a little bit hand in hand. So, you know, but um, yeah, thank you for being here. How's it going? It's going good. I'm just moving us upstairs closer to the Wi-Fi box because this is so <laughs> it's like now MTV Cribs is happening. Give me one sec. <laughs> <laughs> MTV Cribs, show, show me your ass. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> this is the bathroom and this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the attic. This okay, is my boyfriend's cool. office. Okay, cool. So this yeah. should hopefully be better, and I'll move away so you can like see the top of my head. Hi. Hi. Um, okay. Yeah, this is great. Okay. Is this working on your end in terms of um, signal? Sort of. <laughs> yeah. I'll just let you talk. <laughs> Okay, cool. Yes. So you mentioned the podcast called Sober Sex, which is <laughs> um, about, yes, recovery and sexuality, but also like creativity and authenticity and mental health and uh, gender identity and play and how we can kind of survive those things, hopefully together. <laughs> That's so good. I mean, I saw I saw you had a couple of people on there that I recognized and I think, yeah, especially sobriety is obviously a really big topic in my podcast as well, but also stuff like social media. Um, I mean, generally, because I feel like you're sort of an expert on this topic. I mean, you know, we as try. far as you can, <laughs> we try. Because um, I also read you've been sober for like 17 years or something. Yeah, yeah this month it's been 17 years and it's, it's not via virtue. It's definitely via necessity, but I think that... Um, kind of being vocal about that within the context of nightlife is really important just so people know that it can be done, you know, and that if they're struggling with drugs or alcohol or mental health, that like there is a path through this industry, but we have to talk about it and offer each other support in order for that to be possible. Absolutely. And do you feel like, I mean, I've seen in the last couple of years, more and more bigger artists just advocating for sobriety. And that's definitely a big topic. Do you feel like it's getting not more popular, but more of a thing for artists to be sober? I mean, I, I really hope so. <laughs> you know, and I feel like, um, especially as drug use specifically gets a little bit scarier, um, especially in the US right now with fentanyl overdoses and stuff, but it's, it's, it's becoming kind of more of a necessity. And also that like the stigma of being sober or in recovery is um i don't know less like creepy and weird especially post covid because i think a lot of us had to kind of make drastic changes to our lives um coming out of that and trying to get back to touring life so i would say that i think that we are moving in a positive direction and i mean i don't know i got sober during like the indie sleaze era <laughs> which was just like a cocaine addled shit show so i mean i'm excited to see that it's a little bit more socially acceptable for sure Absolutely. And I feel you mentioned the pandemic really briefly or just now. Do you feel like the pandemic has had a big influence on people becoming sober? I mean, I definitely hear a lot about like of like Zoom babies in uh, like um, the recovery circles that I operate in, which is really amazing because it means that a lot more people had kind of sudden access to um, modalities of recovery that might not have felt at quite as easy to get in touch with prior to to like Zoom making all that possible. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, and 
and, and it, I think it's been interesting to kind of watch how the, that kind of explosion translates into into real life. And I know that, like, for me, myself, for instance, like, I moved to the middle of nowhere. Yeah, where <laughs> are you? I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in, like, the French countryside. Look at this. <laughs> it's like, outside is just a field. Oh, um, my God. I mean, that's the dream. I saw you also, are you, like... You work with horses and you're like full on nature vibe now <laughs> i'm like my mental health is only a result of like my, <laughs> my very extra lifestyle when it comes to like living in a field um but that being said this idea that like i think a lot of us you know had to suddenly take our mental health more seriously and so the idea that you know that i think both of us are kind of operate operating spaces to hold these conversations about what mental health and what recovery looks like within our industry in different contexts is really awesome like it's it's great to be able to have these conversations so people have access to this information you know because i think you know like party hard or go hard or go home or rehab is for quitters or like kind of antiquated viewpoints on on how one especially doing nightlife professionally <laughs> um can survive right yeah I think these spaces are really necessary and there's more and more spaces coming up like this. And this is where I feel like social media is doing a really great job and it's a great platform. Obviously there's a really dark side to social media as well. But I mean, with from my experience, from what I've seen with the pandemic, yeah, like either, either people went really healthy and they took advantage of these spaces and they're like, okay, I'm not partying anymore. So, you know, let's focus on mental health. Or people got really into a hole because they all of a sudden didn't have the communities anymore that they're used to and then got really lonely and, you know, started drinking a lot. And it was not just, it's not just about alcohol and drugs, but just generally feeling really miserable, like you lost your job and all that. So I feel like people went either that way or the other way. Yeah. And I think also a lot of times, like the latter kind of leads to the former, <laughs> yeah. like the there is some grace in kind of hitting a rock bottom and being able to like have a place to make necessary changes from if you don't want to die. So that's, you know, important. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, I mean, yeah, it's such a great way of putting that too. Like you have to go to the dark side to like see the light and, and all that. And I feel like that's where a lot of us are coming from, like coming from a really dark place and hitting rock bottom. And I feel like it rarely happens that someone, you know, becomes, a person that's so inspired and, and all that without having a downfall like yeah. that yeah. well can you talk a little bit about I'm sorry to like take over the interview I'm like can you tell me about your experience in the end I'm crying this is like yeah. a therapy <laughs> session um, no but I'm curious is like what made you want to start the podcast I, um, I struggle with so I got COVID right in the beginning in April 2020 and developed long COVID from it like it was really really terrible it was like wheelchair bed bound for like a year so that really obviously my whole mental health collapsed and I was feeling really terrible not just physically but also mentally but then taking control over my body I realized I have to the only way for me to really change is changing my mind and changing my approach to things so that was my rock bottom and I'm still struggling I still can't really play more than once a week or you know like I'm still very much struggling and someone who's not like a very established artist it's it's pretty it was pretty rough for me to be like oh i can't play catch up with all these other artists and and touring is really hard and it's still it's still a struggle but i realized that the mind body connection is the only thing that i, I can really work on because physically there's really no pill or no therapy yeah. for this and you know like all the gaslighting from doctors and stuff didn't help either so i'm like you know what like all i can do is really work on my mind and and that's what I've been doing. So I've been really getting into neuroplasticity, into um, brain retraining, into really focusing what you can do with your mind to change your physical experience as well. So there's so much you can do. And obviously, mind-body connection is the strongest point. Like, it's all neurological. There's so much you can do. So that really got me into it. And I realized, you know, as more the more I spoke out about it on social media, I realized the more... Like there's so many people out there that are struggling and not just physically, but really just mentally, like, you know, sure. just being really stressed with touring schedules or the demand or the pressure from the industry or whatnot. There's so much and no one talks about it. And I'm like, what the fuck? No one talks about this shit. Like we need to talk about this. And so, yeah. No, and then, and yeah. seriously, and thank you so much for kind of holding space for those conversations. Cause it sounds like, 
your experience is like really intense and congratulations on making you know like lemonade <laughs> as Beyonce says out of lemons but um but this idea of kind of realizing that you know <laughs> light stage capitalism and an industry that kind of rewards um kind of like a like grinding mentality being something that's kind of untenable moving forward for a lot of us and especially if like in terms of like both both environmental sustainability, physical and mental sustainability, like we have to make some changes. And I think holding space to talk about what changes those could possibly be is really, really important because otherwise, like, you know, I, I look at somebody's like 15 dates in two weekends <laughs> tour schedule and I'm just like, oh, am I not doing enough? And, and then reality, you're like, like, are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, you need to ask that person, you're like, are you okay doing that? Like, I don't understand. And I mean, some people are, but others are like, no, I'm actually not okay. And I mean, obviously, like, your experience is what also sparked for you to do your podcast, right? I mean, I felt like the reason that it kind of, the seed of it was very much around, like, the idea that sex and sexuality were very kind of pathologized within mm. recovery communities and, like, and wanting to kind of offer spaces to discuss what, like, with, like, beyond the taboo you know, and, and that kind of evolved into conversations about, like, uh, <laughs> the thrilling, like, the, the good side, which is, like, creativity, authenticity, like, the process of recovery and the joy found in that, and then also, like, trauma, rape culture, mental health, like, yeah. the less, you know, like, the, the things that, we, I guess, we are start struggling to kind of recover from in a more, like, complete sense, and what that looks like in practice, right? Yeah. So, it was also like we were it was covid so we had time it's fun you know? it's fun too and you know I'm, i mean i'm up, like i guess you see also a lot of people that are responding and they're like wow this really opened my eye or like this helps or you know like just reading people send these messages or just hearing that it just it ha like if it just helps one person it makes the whole thing worth it right totally i think that's that's the way to see it but well yeah. and just to pause there like I also think that these conversations like interpersonally like regardless of who's hearing them I think that like to feel held in community even if it's just like you and me having a conversation about this stuff in the context of our industry like is really powerful you know because yeah. it's like it's easy to think that like I'm the problem if I'm struggling in a space that's actually difficult to survive in right? yeah absolutely when in reality like we're all kind of having a hard time or you know a lot of us are having a hard time let's not generalize so how do we kind of like what do we do with that and how do we support each other yeah I mean yeah like let's talk about it how do we support each other like what's something that you think is good I mean so this like normally I ask the same questions but I feel like this we're already talking about like using tools and, and, and what, like, what do you do for yourself and what do you do and think helps the community as well? What we can do as a community. Um, I mean, there's, I think there's a lot of behaviors that are very much attached to kind of my life in sobriety that I find are generally helpful, like meditation, like kind of using my experience to benefit others. So like if I'm struggling, instead of kind of having a self pity party, like, I can ha either ask for help or I can reach out and see if somebody else needs my help. Right. Yeah. And that kind of gets me out of myself. So those are kind of good foundational <laughs> practices. Um, but then when it comes to like touring and, and staying kind of mentally and, and staying creative and kind of staying mentally um, in a good place, like <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot of work, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I like for me, structure make like structure makes me feel really, safe and sane and like I feel like I, there are practices that I can kind of take on the road so you know I try and have a kind of rigorous physical practice and train you know five days a week I try and do morning pages I try <laughs> like there's a lot of you know just things that I find help, help me feel secure no matter like and grounded no kind of no matter where I'm at or what life is like and like if I'm kind of ticking these boxes and trying to stay present in that in those practices like I feel pretty good on the day to day, which is really a relief. The hard part is, is when I'm doing all the things and the things don't work, mm. right? And I'm sure you've experienced with long COVID because like, that's the scary part, right? Kind of having an unreliable um, relationship with oneself. Yeah. yeah. 
Absolutely. And so then, yeah, then the, the changing the nature of my uh, internal dialogue from one that's very much about like, get your shit together. <laughs> <laughs> like suck it up you don't have time for your feelings yeah. which you know I think is a, is a like is a, is a internal dialogue in a way that we speak to ourselves that I hear from a lot of people that I'm close to you know who even including those who have been in recovery for many years which is so kind of heartbreaking like I didn't know that's how I was talking to myself until mm. I you know started mm. therapy um and so kind of changing that that dialogue into one that's like honey know it's hard and I'm not gonna abandon you here like I'm like crying at the airport at 6 a.m I'm so tired yeah (laughs) just to be like I know it's hard I have your back like we can do this to so it's a much more kind of like a lot of parts work is involved yeah in kind of taking care of the parts that are feeling freaked out and like really destabilized or really activated and kind of having like a sense of a wise adult part of myself that can kind of take the wheel and take care of the, the parts that are like losing their shit. Yeah, I love I love that. I mean I call that I call that part my higher self. And I know like it's a little, love you know, like the language power. around it. <laughs> higher power, whatever higher self, more compassionate self. Mm-hmm. And like I mean it's also I've done a lot of inner child work. I know for some people it's like, what is that? But like it's yeah, taking care of those parts that are so fragile and vulnerable and like you said, sometimes you need like the tough love and like, like the grandmother, like talk, like, ah, you got to like get your shit together and do all that. But like a lot of people think that's all they need. And that's, you know, power through like that whole thing of just like, just power through. It's like, no man, or just rest. Or- yeah. Just maybe just rest and like hug yourself and tell yourself that you love yourself. Cause I see yeah, that too. And I think, and I think I also, it's, I'm so happy for you. Yeah. Yeah. And likewise, to kind of have access to a different, a different way of kind of dealing with oneself, because I think, you know, I, I would love it if the other kind worked, because I got really good at it, <laughs> you know, like, <clears throat> just like, again, like, and kind of goes with this, like, get in the grind, hardcore attitude, if you can't do it, then you're fucking weak. Like, <laughs> but I realized that, like, <clears throat> instead of kind of going away, the parts that were freaking out just got louder, because they weren't getting their needs met. <laughs> Um, but I, and I, I really appreciate like you're talking about kind of inner child work. And I know that for me, that was really difficult to kind of conceive of it in those terms for a long time. A, because I have like no memory of my childhood, <laughs> yeah. um, but B, because like, I just didn't have that much compassion for this, like very sensitive kid that I was. So it was much easier. And perhaps this is helpful for those of us who were joining us on the internet, um, to think about it as like being as you mentioned i'm a horse person (laughs) and like an animal person generally but like would i if if i was with an animal but like imagine my dog was freaking out like would i be like get your shit together it would be so fucked up to be like oh my god we don't have time for your bullshit (laughs) oh my god to be like honey i got you it's gonna be okay so i I, I talk to like my parts is like if they're scared animals you know just to be like because yeah. also not kind of giving the giving the scared animal who has no capacity for like controlling the situation the reins of, of like i'm not letting them steer because they're not capable so it's not kind of like diving into that narrative of like it's not okay it's not going to be okay but it's also not kind of switching into the space of like like hardball for sure <laughs> kind of like yeah like that like present and centered and like like yeah like the higher self like a wise adult being like i got this it's gonna be okay i won't abandon you i know it's scary but it's gonna be okay like i i won't i won't abandon you here it's like a really helpful kind of through line (laughs) yeah the little little self pep talk i think that's very valuable to have and it's very hard to learn like i mean in the beginning you're like what i never talked to myself like that but i think yeah, that's the only thing, you know, that, that grounds you. Know, a lot of people expect that someone else will do that for them. They look for help and somewhere else. And as soon as you start externally kind of relying on someone to calm you down, it's, I mean, I'm sorry, but a lot, a lot of people, yeah, you just get disappointed. You're not a child anymore. No one will do that for you. No one, you know, I mean, yeah, people will hug you and stuff, but in the end, you have to do all the work yourself. And that's a hard truth to wake up to, I yeah. think. 
Well, I mean, I think it can be interesting, like as a strategy to kind of um, set up relationships that you know are co-regulating, right? Yeah. So like to in advance and also to like, if I think it's important to ask consent in the moment of like, do you have space for this right now? Do you have capacity to hold my big feelings and have yes. relationships where you can kind of have have point people but you know like as you say like a lot of the times especially if you're in a different time zone or you're on the road or if it's like again 6 a.m at an airport which i'm always having a meltdown <laughs> um, like that's th then the kind of desire to be able to kind of self-soothe and self-regulate yeah. is really important and then also this idea of like if i do outsource that on a regular basis and i don't learn that myself i'm kind of in danger of that like victim triangle mm -hmm. right where i like mm -hmm. I like, I'm the victim and I make somebody a bad guy and then I expect a rescuer. But often like the rescuer and the bad guy um, will kind of oscillate because like no one will save me. Yes, <laughs> so yes. It's a nightmare, you know? It means that I'm always kind of powerless over my internal like equilibrium and that's like a shitty place to be. Yeah, because you make yourself dependent on someone else regulating your your nervous system or something else. I mean, bad coping strategies like drugs or sex addictions or addictions in general. Or I mean, yeah, all of that. So, yeah, definitely finding the source within and kind of the power is in there for everyone. That's like that's a beautiful thing, and a lot of people don't realize that. But yeah. I guess yeah, when you go through hard things. But I wanted to ask you so yeah what's your story <laughs> you know how did you get to this point of, yeah um i mean i got like when i first started djing i was like 17 18 and very quickly found drugs and loved them very much um, because they kind of offered as you said like a way to kind of self-regulate uh that i hadn't had access to previously yeah you know like i mentioned being like a sensitive kid like yeah like really sensitive never very cool <laughs> and finally i had like access to a thing that like made me feel really cool and like not give a fuck what people thought and so it was a great thing until it wasn't you know it wasn't really fast <laughs> yeah um, and like because it was so effective it was very difficult um when a it stopped like being as effective because it started to affect the rest of my life in negative ways Mm -hmm. including relationships including career including obviously bank account because i was like spending all of my rent money on cocaine um and i was lucky enough to get <laughs> gifted the surprise party of an intervention wow. at age 20 <laughs> and, um and like i think it was a real grace that i took it seriously like i believed what they were saying in rehab essentially that like if i put my recovery first that i could have anything yes and if i anything came before my recovery I would lose it right and like you know and everybody around me was like please like don't be a DJ like can you do literally mm. any other job and I was very adamant about the fact that I was like going to be a DJ <laughs> so that meant like really taking that recovery seriously and um for me that was 12 step oriented and if anybody in the chat <laughs> anybody watching um has questions about that about recovery or how to get clean or sober like feel free to slide up in my dms i'm always available for those conversations um but you know like the, the what was promised as a result of putting this thing first about like kind of smashing my ego and like what i think i i needed um which was to have my way most of the time <laughs> in order to be happy and comfortable don't you know um mm -hmm. and kind of like live to be of service um that like if i believe that and if i try and live that way then i have a lot of freedom um and unfortunately kind of like the reasons around using and or the kind of downsides of having a uh, you know a human condition <laughs> uh meant that i've also struggled with like anxiety and depression within sobriety and had to kind of deal with that and hence a lot of these tools that we're talking about today which are you know like i would rather you know i used to think that like if you were anxious or depressed in recovery it's because you were doing recovery wrong and like that's because i was an asshole <laughs> so no. the, the humility of like you know suffering in in these specific ways and then like finding ways and 
pathways to get well and also to like as we were kind of talking about like to love myself even in the difficult moments have been really really good and then I think more recently it's like as a result of a drastic lifestyle change which is like mostly times with like dogs and horses in a big field <laughs> which I realize is a great privilege but it's actually much less expensive than living in Paris um <laughs> has been really revolutionary for kind of just feeling like like it's only really the last year since moving out here that I felt um like somatically mm. regulated yes <laughs> in my life. That's absolutely. A good I highly recommend it and then I think also for in terms of touring and stuff this year I'm only touring with my creative partner Mile Maelstrom who's part of RAR yeah. our label that we founded and like have being two on the road especially with somebody I, I love and trust life changing I bet. Yeah. Wow. What a story. Thank you so much for sharing. And I mean, I have a couple of questions. Go crazy. So when you're, you're, yeah, when your dearest people did that intervention with you, how did that make you feel? Oh my God. It was so horrible. <laughs> yeah. How do you approach someone to do that? You know, it was the scariest moment of my life but it was also like the best because like look what happened of course. <laughs> um, 17 years later um so they worked with some and there is a job title of interventionist you might have seen some of the television yeah. show intervention which is <laughs> a fine program yeah. um and basically it's like if people uh, so it's it's helpful if it's organized by somebody who's kind of a facilitator outside so they can kind of hold um, the line and prepare everybody in a really consistent way. Yeah. Um, and I joke with most of my friends that like I'm prepared for their intervention. Oh <laughs> everyone, I'm like, I can't wait to give somebody else. But um, <laughs> basically you, you, you write a letter. So you, you have something written and prepared yes. and um, you write a letter from a place of love about how much you care about this person and how their addiction or their alcoholism or whatever fucked up behavior they're involved in is uh, causing harm and how hard it is to watch them do that. And then you kind of have a unified consequence if they don't accept the offer of treatment. Mm. Um, and uh, for me, it was like losing access to my family, like, and the, the friends that were involved in that. And that wow. was a really big price to pay. And I think that they were ready to like step away and be out of my life. And that I is a hard a, ultimatum it's a big deal. <laughs> with I mean, being 20 years old that's wow that must have been so difficult i mean but it made the choice really easy yeah you know which i think is the goal but you have to be able to stick to it because if like the person that you're trying to intervene upon doesn't believe you then yeah. like then you're fucked <laughs> it's such a i mean like the concept of interventions is great obviously but it's so hard where so all of a sudden you feel like someone someone's taking over control and and you don't really have a choice anymore it's like being a child again but you're an adult and you're like wait what but i mean i'm asking this because i'm wondering when i see or just when and if anyone sees someone like someone who's really close to them struggling how do you go about that i mean obviously your friends and family did a really great professional way of hardcore. like interventing yeah hardcore but like how do I approach a friend like, hey, I think you have a problem. Like most, most people just don't want to hear that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's tough. And I think it's, you know, it's especially difficult if like, I know people tried to approach me before that point and I wasn't ready to hear them because I could find, I could, you know, like easily pick out like how they were fucked up and how they were mm -hmm. hypocritical and um, like, and rip them to shreds, you know, like, so um, I think the, the thing that was effective was this kind of unified front and like a, a real consequence. But also, you know, I think it's, there's de definitely gentler ways to kind of start that conversation. Like that's the end of a road, right? Mm -hmm. If once you're ready to kind of like, once you see somebody in enough pain and once you are, you are in, in enough pain watching somebody that you care about hurt themselves, like that's that's the dead end right like that's when the consequences have to be very real but there can definitely be kind of more gentle um openings to that place which i think a, a lot of like wonderment can be really useful and kind of like 
like asking for the person to explain to you like what's motivating them like how the behavior makes them feel like what problems mm. it's solving and then just kind of like judgment free like oh wow that's really interesting yeah. like yeah. um and then you know the beauty of the the way i got sober was again via 12-step programs which are free universally accessible everywhere um and i think that can be a really useful kind of path that like if someone's interested if someone's curious about it or kind of open to a conversation about like their behavior and again like it's not just for drug and alcohol it's for literally everything it's like gambling or sex or food it's like yeah. <laughs> it's there's many of 12 step programs but um this idea that uh they're not al like they're not being judged they're not alone and like if you're if you are close to somebody with with um who's struggling with you know addiction be it behavioral or substance but based like there's also support for you yes um which is cool and that's a program called Al-Anon or codependence anonymous <laughs> check it out yeah i mean someone just said on the chat reframe is also a great sobriety app yeah there's a lot of resources out there of course and um yeah so if, but I, but, but still, I feel like a lot of people struggle with like, where do I even start? Like even just like talking to a therapist, I feel mm -hmm. a lot of people are very overwhelmed when not just with, you know, addiction issues, but like, how do you start asking for help? Like, <laughs> yeah, just in general, it's like people don't want to ask for help. And when I struggled so much with long COVID in the beginning, I mean, my mother was like, oh, you should, you know, like, I'll help you. And I was just like, no, I, like, I don't need help. Like, I was always proud to be really independent. But in the end, I couldn't even cook for myself. Like, you know, I had to, I had to get help. And, so, but it doesn't need to get to that point. Like you can add, always ask for help. And that's what I learned, but I feel a lot of people are struggling. So that's why I was asking that intervention question. Cause that's obviously like the last stop and so happy for you that you had people who cared so much yeah. that they did that. Right. It's Cause a lot of people question. are just like, you're weird. I'm not your friend anymore or blah, blah. Like they just, you know, and that's, that's where it gets really dangerous, obviously. So yeah, I'm really happy for you that they, that they were there. But also when you said, when they were like, oh, don't become a DJ, literally anything <laughs> else with a DJ. It's funny when you say that, because now I think, you know, there's, we are DJs and we are different. And there's many like us out there that are not addicted, like, ha you know, they're not like in this dark place. And I know my sister is always like, do you do drugs or like, is, you know, is there like, nah? and I'm like, no, like there's a way of doing it and not falling into that hole. And there's a lot of stigma around people at work and nightlife that everyone's a drug addict and everyone's unhappy. And, you, you know, you can't do this for the rest of your life. And it's just not true. What do you think about that? I mean, I think it's part of the reason that it's important to have these conversations, right? That it's like, there's a, that it's, it can actually be really liberating. Um, if you if you do want to kind of take a path through this work, um, by which I mean nightlife, <laughs> but also sobriety, um, that it's possible. But also, I think I don't know. It's like the fact that visibility is important, right? Because there is this kind of like crazy stereotype of like I mean, and and that's that is all I knew, right? Like I remember while I was in treatment, which was a long time ago, <laughs> there was like um, a, the Village Voice and. New York had like a cover story of like sober DJs and it blew my fucking mind. <laughs> I was like, it's possible, you know? So this idea that like, it can be like, it, it's, it's important for people to be able to see that it, it is possible and that, and that it's a, it, and it can be done, you know? Cause I think a lot of people, especially kind of entering from a more kind of chaotic or like drug fueled nightlife experience are just like, how the <laughs> like why would you even do that first of all but also like how do you do that if you want to do it but you don't have any like role models or you don't have any access to people who are like clubbing sober right yeah and so to kind of be here to talk about what that feels like and like the fact that it's even possible is really important absolutely you know visibility is probably the number one thing and I mean the more you hear from more and more people are like yeah I'm sober and I'm still a DJ or I'm still working in nightlife like it's it's so inspiring and that's what keeps us all going that we know we have a community of people and you just need to keep hearing it from people and, and being around these people as well you know like obviously after my experience um i my friend 
relationships change. Like I have friends who are, you know, like I'm not fun anymore. So they're not around anymore. And I mean, fun is like for them, not fun because, you know, like it's not like just my lifestyle anymore, but other people I got really closer to because they're like, yo, I really love what you're doing and the way you are. And that's, that's cool. So you kind of see it also, you know, you may, you might lose friends, but it's, it might be for the better. So. Well, and yeah. And, and the idea that I think you were talking about, like asking for help before it's like, it will become clear pretty fast. Like who is supportive of a journey that involves kind of like, trying to be well yeah you know like in a sustainable or long-term way if the path of like ferocious partying is no longer accessible for you anymore whatever that looks like yeah right so if people aren't available to kind of like show up in that space thank you yeah exactly <laughs> thank you goodbye you can see yourself out um, or i see you in 10 years when you make your own experience <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes also like i mean the, the, I'll, I'll hold the seat <laughs> yeah exactly. but um but on the other hand, like the people who do show up and are kind of like curious to see what that's like with you are really like, those are incredible relationships, you know? And like, and you can meet people along the way, like this new friendship. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, you are living on a countryside with your animals and stuff like, yeah, your life is it's like, great. This is sustainable. You can grow old like this. Like it's perfect, you know? So it's not just like you will forever live in your little apartment in Berlin somewhere and like, meh. Like, that's just not, <laughs> yeah, we've all done that in our 20s, but it's it's different now. So, yeah, this is really inspiring. I love I love our chat. It was great. A pleasure. I'm totally excited to talk to you. And I saw um, in the chat, somebody asked about how the intervention felt. <laughs> yeah, like I saw that too. I, like, barf cried for, like, I think, like, 19 hours. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> like, it was so scary, but you know, cause I like, I couldn't imagine, you know, you think about what your life is going to be like, and I could not imagine what my life was going to be like sober. And like, I, I decided to like take the offer <laughs> that was on the table, which was go to treatment. And it was, it was the best choice that was kind of essentially made for me in the world. So like the beauty of that, is, I think it's like, it, just because, because one is scared of trying the new thing or like the unknown um, feels very daunting, like doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. And I think that that's a really helpful kind of grounding, grounding concept, you know, of like just because it's scary. Like I'm sure it was terrifying for you to ask for help at first when like shit was felt, feel, feeling really dire, you know, of like, fuck, like what's yeah. it going to be like to like need help for my life. And maybe it's okay like maybe it led to deeper connections and maybe it's like actually yeah life is cool with support <laughs> it sucked asking for help but like in the end I was with my mother for seven months and she took care of me like she's never had before in my life so we really bonded over that and that was actually a really beautiful experience so I feel like yeah I mean having hard experience but trying to see the silver lining in it and like making it a purpose and making it like finding purpose in these hard things is is so beautiful but like I have another question about your intervention. Love <laughs> Love <talking about you. laughs> um, was your Everybody so here, yeah. was your initial <laughs> yeah? Let's go. Um, when when all these like when the inter intervention first happened, was your what's your what was your first intuition to go to people that would validate the opposite? Like, would you contact people that you knew would be like, oh, these you're, fuck your family and your friends type of thing? I mean. Uh, oh no, I like it. Basically, it was like the car is waiting. You're going, you're like, give me your phone. <laughs> like, wow. It was, it was like straight, straight to treatment, which was great. I mean, it was definitely, I felt like an ambush. And I realized it was happening like maybe 20 minutes before it was supposed to happen. It was like two hours late because I just kept, I was like A, loaded, and B, kept trying to like figure out a way to like not go to my, my parents' house. <laughs> and, um, and eventually, like, they had to kind of come get me and put me in a cab. And, like, like I was, like, I remember being, like, a cat going to the vet, like, scraping the walls of my apartment, oh my like, God. stairwell to be, like, I don't want to make go. Oh, my God. It was horrible. I mean, it was, like, really a terrible experience. But, you know, like, it, I, 
the message was very clearly very loving yeah. and it was really hard to hear how you know how people were being hurt by the fact that i was like deeply dishonest fucked up all the time like unreliable you know unrecognizable to people who cared about me and yeah. so you know it was like it's the worst worst experience of my life but also the very best <laughs> you know yeah i mean i have a really close person who had a similar experience but she was around like 14 15 and there was no intervention but she had a real problem with cocaine and other things and she kept going to the psychiatrist who kept feeding her like adderall and like ritalin and like all these things that were just like replacing the problem really with another problem and and her parents they just didn't show any love and it was really cold and like kind of like okay we see that you have a problem but we don't know what to do and like in the end you know, like now that she's older and has kids and all that, she's really, you know, realized like my parents weren't there for me at all. I mean, that's what she's saying. Like, it's just, it's really hard to like not get the love from the people that you expect it to. And obviously that's traumatizing. She still holds it against them all the time. And there's like no sure. real, res like, you know, like con she doesn't really have a conclusion with it. And that's really hard to see. So maybe in the end, like it would have been better for the parents to do an intervention, even though she would have hated that in the moment and yeah, would have I felt mean, betrayed. Think, well, and again, like I think that it's the, it's one of the more loving acts you can do for somebody. Like yes. it sucks for everybody. Like, yes. No one wants to do this, but I do think it is a really powerful thing, especially if it's done in like kind of a trauma informed way. Yeah. And like, Again, if anybody needs support with this stuff, like uh, my interventionist is named Heather Hayes. She's on Instagram. She's fantastic. We're still friends. <laughs> and so if you need, if you're planning an intervention, reach out to her because she's the fucking best. Shout out Heather. Oh my Hayes. God. Yes, Heather. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think doing your own intervention with someone can be really fucking hard. And like, especially if there's no family involved, if friends are like, yo, you have a problem, like you need to do something like. How do you, you know, if I see someone having a problem, I don't know what, if it's my place to really do that. It's very, yeah. it's, it's a difficult thing. For sure. I mean, I think especially kind of as a friend, like there, if without a point person that they imagine it would be very difficult, especially if people in the group are still using, I think, I think that can be very confusing because then like the addict or, you know, the person that you're intervening on, if you're still doing the behavior, even if it's more casual and less destructive, they're like, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very delicate thing because also like again if you kind of cross if you cross the boundary and stay in the relationship without kind of holding the consequence that can be challenging and I think also if um if and in any case right but if you set a boundary and then kind of renege <laughs> um that can be really like it can be confusing for both parties and you can kind of disre dysregulate the relationship somebody I mean this is totally a different um like vain but something somebody who's really been helpful about teaching me about like consent and boundaries is this person consent at consent.wizardry aka Mia Schachter and they are awesome like as um especially kind of integrating like a lot of because I, I do think the like, intervention modality is really um it can be not so trauma informed and so mm -hmm. to have like a, a kind of consent practices background as like a foundation for any kind of boundary setting is really 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 cool wow i mean just the, the terms consent and boundary i feel like that's something i never knew in my even up like up until a couple of years ago i'm like just doesn't just this concept it doesn't really got me or my family never you know never understood that i feel like that generation of my parents are just just doesn't really get it so <laughs> no. i think yeah I mean, it's, can you imagine it's, yeah and even but now, I mean, that's why we're doing this work yeah you know? totally like, that's why we get to be the generation who's like sharing this information because i do think like it can especially you know as and, and this is kind of a pivot but i think it is related like stuff like we we hear more about kind of consent in the club <laughs> yeah or like making club spaces more kind of um spaces of consent yeah as opposed to rape culture <laughs> yes <laughs> um that like learning this language and having it not be a punitive line, like having it not be like, like oh, the fuck it, like now we all have to learn about this because like everyone's fucking behaving badly. <laughs> but in fact, like an invitation to learn about one's own like somatic consent of like, what does a, a, a like hard yes feel like in my body and how do I start to kind of like make choices from that place and therefore 
how am I able to kind of, and listen when my body says no, which I'm sure you've done a lot of learning oh, yeah. about recently, you know? And so like, and, and then from that place, how can I encourage others to kind of like communicate about their boundaries and consent and like encourage them to listen and, and respect, like how can I encourage other people to listen to and respect their own um, like intuition and, and embodied boundary practices? Yeah, that's so, I it's love a- that you just said that. I mean, it's so like just learning the boundary and consent concept within yourself, like with different parts, right? Like even when you talk to your like very vulnerable part and your, like, your higher self and like all that, you know, like even like sit, telling your higher self, I don't want to hear it. No, I mean, just like learning, <laughs> learning the boundaries within yourself. Yeah, it's so important. And yeah, it's not just about sex. The consent doesn't just, you know, this doesn't mean just, you know, because a lot of people are like, oh, consent. Yeah, it's like a sexual thing. It's like, no, it's not like it's totally not. It goes way deeper. But than I mean, I that. think that that's like a new idea. Well, and also it's like it's everywhere, right? That like I used to feel like and maybe you also like I think a lot of artists have this assumption that like every offer on the table I have to take. Otherwise, I'm like not worthy of my job. Otherwise, like I'm somehow ungrateful. Otherwise, like somebody's going to fucking come up behind me and like take my spot in the sun because there's only so much fucking, you know, DJ spots available to go around and like this kind mm. of scarcity mentality where like even if I'm like, wait, there's like two layovers <laughs> and I'm getting paid 200 euros and like I have to like sleep at the promoter's couch. Like, I mean, that might have been fucking when I was like 20 but like I'm 37 <laughs> like that's not happening. yeah no I'm, fucking I'm like, way offer I'm like my body's like no <laughs> yeah I mean I'm happy that you say that because I say no all the time in the beginning I was like oh my god all these opportunities I'm saying no but like actually what I realized the more I say no the more people like want me which is kind of interesting I never like realized that now it's all like coming back to to me as like a positive thing because you make yourself more rare i mean that's like all brand building and all that blah blah like it's not i mean but a lot of people yeah like you said they're like they just want to take every opportunity and think it's so important but you know what like it's not like there's enough space for everyone your time will come and it's good to say no because you make yourself more interesting well and also i think it makes it more sustainable right because like we do also hear about like burnout pretty regularly and like mental health crises and like that's a serious thing in our industry you know like afem the uh, it, association for electronic music has been doing a lot of work in in terms of mental health and stuff and like their findings are terrifying <laughs> like it's like as a as a person working in uh in in touring music yes. like be it artist or tour manager or crew or whatever like we're four times as likely to experience depression, three times as likely to experience anxiety. Like, so the, the being able to kind of be in touch with your actual feelings about what's on the table is I think super important because if I say, if I override my embodied response too much, like I'm going to A, burn out and B, like fucking hate my job, which like is the thing I've wanted to do my whole life. Yes, you know? exactly. Like, no, everyone should move to the countryside and have horses and dogs. <laughs> I mean, I'm saying, but I like, I'm aware of this is like an incredible privilege. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's not like anyone can do, like, it's not that difficult. It's actually more expensive to live in a city probably, you know? So, um, I mean, not as like a lot of people ha- don't have, can't do it because of family or whatever. But yeah, I mean, it's very important to make your life sustainable and not hate your job. Like if you start hating your job, you're really like, why the fuck am I doing this in the first place? You know, you need to keep reminding yourself why you do it. And it's obviously, yeah, not the wrong reasons. Yeah. And I mean, I do think again, like this is very much like a get to career. Like it's, it's a crazy thing to be able to make a living off of making and, and playing music. Um, and so it can be very easy to shame oneself if you're feeling struggling around that, you know, it can be like, like, how dare you complain about it? Like everyone wants yeah. this job. Like you, like, you're so lucky you get to be a DJ. <laughs> like that's not a real job, but you know, I do think that like a, in order to be good at anything, like it does take work. And like, even though I might, I feel like I don't get paid to actually play music. I get paid to like get on a plane and literally go anywhere because I hate that. <laughs> um, but like, so to, to kind of take, even if it is an incredible privilege to be able to do this work, like taking one's needs seriously and having compassion for the parts that are struggling is like 
really important if we want to, you know, have any longevity. Yeah, it is still a job. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it is a fucking job. Yes, my aunties and whoever in her family meet up. No, no, I'm just kidding. It's like, <laughs> so what do you do now? I'm like, yeah, I'm still a DJ. Like, yeah. Shout out aunties. Yeah. <laughs> We're out here. We're out here. Um, yeah, I mean, are there any last things you want to add um, to like round up this great conversation? Uh, I mean, I would just say like, again, uh, if uh, mental health is not my forte, I'm not a therapist. <laughs> But if you are struggling with um, addiction or alcoholism or if somebody you love it, like my DMs are open. Um, and yeah, like, thank you so much for holding space for, for these conversations because it's like, you know, we all need support. And it's, it's if we have the capacity to, to help people who have struggled with things that we've struggled with or who are struggling with things that we have struggled with in the past, like what a, what a great opportunity to be of service. Yes, I agree. And thank you so much for being such a great speaker and being so being also sharing your story. I mean, this is a very personal thing and <laughs> blasting it out to the world. I mean, you know, hey. this will be out forever in the internet. No, but it's really I'm very grateful. And I think it's super inspiring to hear this. And, and yeah, like even just for me, and if it just helps anyone out there, like it's totally worth talking about these things. I think it's very, very important. So Thank you so much for talking all this. I could probably talk to you for hours, but you, have to you know, I need to keep it on. <laughs> I, I need to keep it under an hour, unfortunately. I mean, I don't have to, but you know, <laughs> keep it compact so people will actually listen to it. Because this will be on YouTube and Spotify after. Um, awesome. Yeah, it's funny because I like the Instagram live thing because I feel like it's easy for people to tune in. But I mean, it's not like the main platform for me. I think Spotify is people prefer it and p more people listen to it there afterwards. Cool. So I don't know. Wait, wait, well, like, how do you do your podcast? You just just like it? through podcasting platforms, like yes. via Zencaster, which just started making me pay that I'm very bitter about. <laughs> but, you know, I feel like I, I, I mean, I guess that's kind of like inside baseball stuff, but, but like, however we give access to information that can be helpful, like, sick, awesome. Yeah. So free, free, free learning lessons for everyone. I mean, yeah, that's why we do it. Anyways, I let you go back to your horses <laughs> and your beautiful oh, they're, lessons. They're, they're done for the day. <laughs> Frolicking the in the field. field. Yeah. <laughs> go soak it in. I wish I was in nature right now. It's, I'm in the city, so it's a little. I mean, I love it. And I'm not complaining. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's nice. Like the sun's shining, so it's great. You're in Berlin. But, no, I'm in Brooklyn. I'm in New oh, York. Oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> cool. By the way, I'm in New York. Yeah, it's a uh, pollen. Oh God, I mean, yeah, I don't want. We don't need to talk about. It. I'm not complaining. It's just like the pollen. I'm like, ah, I can't even breathe. Oh, no. but... Yes, my dad. We had a similar conversation earlier this week. It's like yeah. I can't. I can't wait. I'm like, go outside. Breathe Are out. your parents in New York? Yes. Nice. In the city. Um, uh, my dad's between his girlfriend's in Harlem, so he's there often. Okay, my mom's cool. kind of between Manhattan and Long Island nice yeah nice Super comfy and tea. <laughs> well let me know if you ever come back to new york and we'll we'll have an alcohol free beverage somewhere awesome <laughs> you right. have a mate for the mass yeah or just tea, tea. I, I mean i love tea so. <laughs> but anyways um yeah thank you so much and we'll stay in touch it was a pleasure have a wonderful night Bye. all right talk to you soon